Funding for All Things Connecticut is made possible by our founding sponsor, People's United Bank. What know-how can do. I'm David Bibby, and I've been given a mission to explore all things Connecticut. CPTV is sending me all over the nutmeg state, my new home. They're dispatching my mission by a messenger called Meg. Hey, does that make me the nut? In this episode, we'll meet young actors who are getting teens talking. See cutting edge tools and tools of yesteryear. And I'll be breaking bread in Peruvian West Hartford. My mission today, I'm to saddle up and hit the trail. Now where's that movie star dressing room they promised me? I guess the golden age of Hollywood is over. Hey, you know what? It happens. While I prepare my steed, meet some young actors helping teens talk. It's 7.34 on a typical school day morning. With the script at their fingertips, a pickup rehearsal on the go. Yeah. And faster than you can say, all school assembly. The looking in theater will play to another packed house and wake up everyone with something like this. Hey, if she didn't want them on the internet, she shouldn't have sent them to me. She trusted you. Hey, here's a link to a live stream. Click it. What is she doing with her gun? She's loading it. Look, they're probably just blanks. Even blanks can kill. I'm not gonna let this happen. Mom, Dad, this wasn't you. They are not going out and entertaining an audience. They have to own that what they're doing is about them. That this happened to me. And when it happened to me, and act, one of the actors actually said this last year in a the discussion, they, it gives them a voice. We were riding by this cat, yo, he was trifling, yo. He was about to get popped with a cat. Unlike other educational touring shows based on literature, history, or predictable fairy tales. I can make you feel better. Looking in looks at real life. Let me see your back. Don't touch my back. And it tackles some of the toughest and touchiest issues that today's kids face. I missed you. I missed you too. The ones lots of schools don't even want to talk about. I just always feel so much better when I see you. In this setting, it's like the most open conversation that you don't see anywhere else. When I tell people about the program itself, I, the first thing I describe is it's this uh, way that we can bring about social change. It brings about discussion where usually it doesn't happen. It helps a lot of people become comfortable with being vulnerable, and I think that it makes the topic's a lot easier to talk about, and people aren't uncomfortable with the things that normally would make them uncomfortable. You're doing something really mean because she broke up with you, so that would probably be a little bit stronger. Under longtime director Jonathan Gilman, theater chair at the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts, Looking In presents scenes about teen suicide, date rape, gay bashing, violence, alcoholism, bullying, and more. Dude, I would have never taken you for a terrorist. What? I asked them to create scenes. And in the process of trying to create the scenes, they have to think about why people behave in the way they do, what's motivating them, what's going on. So they have to look, looking in, they have to look into it in a different kind of way. To make this happen, Gilman auditions hundreds of Connecticut teens for a chance at about 50 spots each year. Those selected must then complete an intensive summer training program. And they start creating the scenes, and the scenes come from their life or the lives of the people they know. Someone I know, very close to me, uh, cuts or used to, and so I had to take that into consideration. And I remember them telling me what happened, so I had to recreate it, and it was really hard. I was able to put forth all of my history with bullying. That was what I experienced in middle school. Before I started looking in, I had never mentioned my, even contemplating the thoughts of suicide to anyone before. 
I think bringing that real life piece um, because we don't talk about it in school because uh, oftentimes you know schools meant for academics and we go through our curriculum and so what Jonathan's group brings that real life application of what's happening and the kids um, just relate to that so much more. But the real magic behind looking in is its refusal to preach or moralize. Instead with Gilman as facilitator the company follows each scene with an open dialogue, one that isn't censored by any adults. Did you wake up one morning and say, oh, well, this is boring, I think I'll be a lesbian? I mean, no. And the secret to making that work is how the play's characters do all the talking with the audience. I'm not gonna let somebody tell me who I am because I know who I am. I feel like that character can connect with me, so I'm gonna tell them like my ex own experience. I, I think that's what the audience member, like feels in a way. And during the question and answer session, the actor is still playing the part. You begin to see, you know, how people are thinking differently in different perspectives. Uh, it just shows you how meaningful the looking in theater is and has been. This is who I like, then don't do it because you shouldn't be ashamed of who you're with. A Capital Region Educational Council program. Looking in has been around for over 30 years. At this recent performance for the Celebrating Differences program, Looking In performed and helped lead diversity workshops with kids from seven different school districts. Usually in regular theater, you're just talking just maybe about something that's fake, like off a script, but this one's about your true feelings, like not making anything up. A rare and brave live arts experience this one-of-a-kind theater opens up dialogue about the challenges, fears, and pains of growing up. Get out, Will. Cammy? Get out. Cammy, please put down the gun. The point is to start discussion through theater. It just makes it less scary. It's just something that you can just look at and say, okay, this is not real, but it's real. All in a good day's creative work that starts on a typical school day morning. For Spotlight on the Arts, I'm Ed Wurzbicki. So I'm here with Victoria, and Victoria is from Terracello Riding Stables, <laughs> and we're here at Lakebridge, and she's saddling me up with what looks to me the biggest horse she could find. And his name is Panza. I can't think why. Panza. Tank, right? Yes. Good. Like a tank. So, Victoria, tell me what goes on with horses in Connecticut. You can find English riding, Western riding, uh, showing. A lot of people ride for pleasure, doing trail rides. There's, there's a whole gamut. And you specialize with dressage? I specialize in dressage. Uh, at this facility here, we do dressage lessons as well as trail rides. So this is Lake Ridge, but in Norfolk, you're open to the public? To... We are. We are open to the public. Um, I have a boarding lesson and training facility there, so we have our show horses in Norfolk. Here at Lake Ridge Stables, we do offer pony camps or kid camps throughout the summer. They're week-long camps, and we start these kids as early as three years old because it teaches them how to be a little bit more versatile, yeah. um, how to be balanced, how to not be afraid of their horses, mm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, Made in Connecticut with the latest technology. Like something out of a science fiction movie, the new age of manufacturing, where you simply pour an ingredient into a machine and some 12 hours later, out comes your product. It's called additive manufacturing, or 3D printing, and it's happening here in South Windsor, Connecticut at Oxford Performance Materials, a plastics company on the cutting edge of technology, founded in 2000 by Scott DeFelice. And when we started, this is what we did. We had this machine, and it's making strands of plastic that are being cut over here. We started out as a raw material company, so we were selling it primarily to two markets, into uh, aerospace and to biomedical. So what we've got here is one of our early products. 
This will typically go to a machine shop who will then maybe make a dental part. Maybe they'll make a spinal implant. OPM also makes its own products by pulverizing the raw plastic into a fine powder. It's structurally strong, it's lightweight, it's biocompatible, it's chemically inert, it's radiation resistant. Turns out it's perfect for airplane parts as well as orthopedic implants. So this is a, you know, a typical cranial prosthesis. OPM's first product, the skull implant, approved by the FDA in 2013. The surgeons love it because it fits so well. You see it has some holes in it. That's so blood vessels can grow through and keep the tissue on top healthy. I would suggest that you know you call and make an appointment if yeah. you can. Neurosurgeon Dr. Inam Qureshi has been performing surgeries for nearly 20 years. He's used several different types of cranial implants. The most common diagnosis that, that requires this sort of thing are patients who have had a traumatic brain injury that required removal of their bone to allow the brain to swell. Uh, she has a brain abscess and she actually may need to have her bone flap removed. Mm -hmm. The main concern we have as surgeons is providing adequate protection for the patient as if it's their own bone. Dr. Qureshi says the typical wait for an implant is four to six weeks. And that's what has him so intrigued by Oxford Performance Materials' new product. Once it's designed, once we have an order, it's five days. It is so much more beneficial for the patient to have that kind of turnaround time. Because normally when bone has to be removed, they have a defect in the skull and therefore no protection to the brain. The turnaround time is truly the marvel of this technology where it takes just one machine to do the work of many. It looks like a sub-zero refrigerator, honestly. It's just a big one. Uh, it, it, it's just a big box with a lot of electronics and lasers. It, it allows for the production of many parts all at once. So we've done builds that have done two or 3,000 parts in them, all different. So what we have here is a three-dimensional build volume. Production manager Elijah Willis uses computer models based on CAT scans to build the implants. Basically, one layer at a time, it's going to progress through the build, eventually getting to a point where all the parts are now completed and you have your parts there floating in a bed of powder, which would then start the uh, uh, excavation process. When OPM was founded in 2000, there were just three employees. Now there are 34. Over the next few years, the growth in aerospace is expected to explode as both commercial and military aging fleets are replaced with lighter, more efficient aircraft. For Oxford Performance Materials, that translates into a surge in business, and the company expects to nearly double its workforce to keep pace. That technology is got the ability to take substantial weight off things that fly. Uh, that's really about energy efficiency. Dave Felice says there are also new orthopedic implants on the way. We're going to go from cranial to spine to trauma markets. There's just so much opportunity to create value. So let's get your bridle on and go for a ride. Yeah. We stretch the skin that's folded up underneath his girth. It pulls the skin tight so he won't get a girth sore. Mm. Oh <laughs> man, that's good. <laughs> it's worth coming just for that. Wow, no wonder you like going out for a ride. According to a study commissioned in 2005 by the American Horse Foundation, Connecticut was estimated to have 52,000 horses, more than any other New England state, placing Connecticut third nationally for density of horses per square mile. That's 52,000 in only 169 towns. No one horse town in our state. I started riding when I was six years old and went right through Pony Club to three-day eventing. Once a major part of Connecticut's land clearance and management, for the most part, horses are now for recreation and companionship. Now, meet artist, writer, and collector Eric Sloan, a Connecticut cultural treasure.
from the heavens to the heartland, to the sweat, toil, and tools that built this great land. Eric Sloan spent a lifetime collecting and capturing the American spirit. The hair stand up on the back of my neck sometimes when I read certain segments from his books. For example, when he talks about taking apart an old foundation of an old barn and he finds in the plaster the handprint of the, the man that built the barn, he believes. And he puts his, takes his own hand and he puts it in that print, in the, in, the, in the plaster, in the mortar. That's just such a compelling description. A prolific writer with over 30 books that chronicled how we once lived and worked, Sloan was also an accomplished painter and illustrator with a vision deeply rooted in rural beauty. He went to capture a mood. You can feel you're in there and you, you know, the rustle of a mouse in the hay or the warmth of the sun coming through the door. It becomes a sensual experience of the senses. But Sloan was also a collector and he was especially passionate about these. The thousands of handmade tools and objects from Pioneer America. And here at the Eric Sloan Museum in Kent, his wooden rakes, planes, hammers and axes help us understand our past and the importance of being in tune with nature. A tool is really an extension of one's hands. So when the work was done, there was this alignment of energy between the mind, the hand, the tool, and the work being done. But Sloan wasn't caught up in some wave of nostalgia. From his cloudscapes to his detailed drawings, to the many essays on American life, his journalistic approach to uncovering the past aimed at deepening our awareness for living life today. He spent so much time exploring the early American experience because he reasoned that these folks did for themselves. They led lives where they were aware of their place and time, and that became a very important theme for him throughout his life, both in his writing and his art. To become a better painter of cloudscapes, Eric Sloan studied meteorology at MIT. But as he fell in love with early America and his sense of awareness grew, he turned to the power of memory and mood to really shape his artistic vision. He painted from memory. He felt that uh, the mind would allow him to paint much more of a mood than a picture. So the process for him really started with his own recollections, like driving across country and he would pay attention to the landscape deeply. And although he painted throughout his lifetime, his fascination with tools grew in the 1960s and 70s. He developed exhibits and displays of his tools, showing them as tools, but also as works of art. And he used to take them around. Then, in 1969, with the support of Don Davis, then CEO of Stanley Tools, the idea for a museum was launched. It's a very significant collection, and it's a very uh, significant glimpse of how Eric Sloan worked. In addition to Sloan's tools and paintings, the now state-run museum has recreated his home studio. There's also a replica of the cabin featured in Sloan's The Diary, of an early American boy. And the museum experience includes the remains of the Kent Iron Furnace, an example of a once thriving state industry built on American resourcefulness. There were over 40 furnaces along the river shed here, starting in Connecticut up into Massachusetts. And one of the furnaces operations took place here on the grounds of what's now the Eric Sloan Museum. There's an integrity and care to Eric Sloan's body of work that's hard to resist. He really spoke about awareness, being aware of your surroundings, of a cloud, of a, a landscape, that constant awareness of the beauty around you. Here in Kent, his spirit is very present in thousands of unexpected and natural ways, inspiring us to live for today, 
dream for tomorrow and to learn from yesterday. All disciplines of riding are catered for in Connecticut, from dressage, show jumping, hunter pace, and more. For a leg up to getting on a horse, you can visit one of the many barns or check out the animal feed stores for information. Or if you're just a natural born horse whisperer, go direct to the horse's mouth. Welcome, I'm at Cora Cora in West Hartford, a Peruvian restaurant that the New York Times says wears the crown for Peruvian cuisine. And I agree, this place has real heart. And I mean, real heart. And here's my Peruvian yeah. guide. Mwah. Mwah. Hola, Babby. Lead on. And you can come too. This, this is good. So this spread before us, these are the fundamentals of Peruvian cuisine. That's correct. Yeah. We have the choclo, which is the corn. Yep. The kernels are the biggest one in the world. All of these plates right here, the jipanca, the he orange, the rocoto, and uh, different kind of peppers that you see, this is the heart of the Peruvian cuisine. And also you have here the black mint, which we call wakatai, and here we have two different quinoa. And also we have the potatoes, which are, uh, we have like 3,000 different varieties mm -hmm. of that's potatoes. One, that's one per Peruvian in Greater Hartford. Exactly. And am I right in saying potatoes were found first for the rest of the world in Peru? Absolutely. Here uh, we have what is called chicha morada. And the chicha morada is made of uh, purple corn. Don't eat the purple corn, but the chicha morada tastes delicious. So, I don't want to stop this lady because she's the chef here and we're going to have a Peruvian feast. Join us. Ceviche appetizer. It's uh, made of um, white fish marinated on lime. And of course you have your onions and uh, garlic. This will be our signature dish for Peru. The lomo saltado, which basically is a stir fry, and uh, we have the influence of uh, the Chinese, and that's an entry as well. That's the seafood uh, rice. And that's somewhat like paella, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's the um, Spanish influence right there. Well, I think with all these influences, we should do it justice and eat. This sauce is available nowhere else in the world. This is Cora, Cora sauce. Formerly known as, but now known as, David Bibby's sauce. Because it's really good. And you have it with these bad boys. Cancha. Cancha. What brought you to America? Politically, the country was not in the best position and so I decided to come here. My brother was here and uh, three years after I came, I decided to open a business, a cleaning service business. And I went from two employees to 120. You can say that if you work hard, you can really make it. So and do you think the American dream is alive and well? Absolutely. So let me introduce you to our Chicha Morada, which is the national Peruvian drink. And do you remember when I was showing you the purple corn? That's what it is. And this was it? This was it. I was intrigued to try it. So here's to Peru. Salute. This is David Bibby, West Hartford at Cora Cora for Breaking Bread. Adios. 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 Thanks for watching. But let's not stop here, we just got acquainted. Join me online at allthingsct.org and tell me what's special to you in your corner of Connecticut.
Funding for All Things Connecticut is made possible by our founding sponsor, People's United Bank. What know-how can do.